Hello, and welcome back to the Come Follow Me Bible Challenge. My name is Jeremy Howard. I am at Orchard Hills Bible Church in Payson, Utah. Thanks for joining me today. As we continue to go through the New Testament, section by section, following along with the schedule that was given by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints for the Come Follow Me curriculum, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is going through the New Testament this year in the uh, Come Follow Me curriculum, the Sunday School curriculum, and I am a Bible church pastor coming along to just give you some thoughts that I have about the Bible that may or may not be helpful to you, but thanks for listening, regardless of what position you hold or uh, what the motivations are for you listening. Thanks for being here. Today it is John 3 and 4. That is, let's see, for the week of February 5th, no, 6th through the 12th. John 2 through 4, actually. There's a lot going on in John 2 through 4. You got the wedding at Cana in John chapter 2. You have the interaction with Nicodemus in John chapter 3. You got the woman at the well in John chapter 4. Oh my goodness. How on earth do you cover that in one week? I just don't understand why the schedule is made that way. Uh, Really, to go through the New Testament, you need uh, a lot of time, more than a year. But uh, today, because the focus of this isn't to cover every single thing, uh, the focus of this is just to cover something I find particularly interesting. Uh, Today we're just going to be focused on the end of John 3. So again, John chapter 3, you have the interaction with Nicodemus, which is exciting, the whole talk about being born again. You have John 3, 16, uh, the most famous verse in all the Bible, I would say, more than Genesis 1, 1, is John 3, 16. Say it with me in your heart, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. That may have been mostly King James. I have no idea what translation I just quoted, but that's what came to my my mind. Everybody knows that verse, right? And the verses around it are really important too. It'd be great for you to look at that and to study that. Um, well, I'm going to the end of John 3. So not the beginning with Nicodemus, not the middle that I just quoted there, but the end. And I actually want to start with the last statement made by John the Baptist, starting in John 3.30. And you can Read, of course, more in that chapter to see the full statement of John the Baptist. And there's a little bit of debate as to whether John the Baptist stops speaking in verse 30 or if he's the one who continues to speak all the way through the end of the chapter. Uh, It seems to me that this is the last statement of John the Baptist. In verses 31 to 36 uh, are the words of John the Apostle, the author of the gospel. So we got two Johns going on here. But uh, let's just look at the text. Let's jump into John 3.30 and read through the end of the chapter. He must increase, but I must decrease. What a great verse. Verse 31. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is from the earth and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. What he has seen and heard, of that he testifies. And no one receives his testimony. He who has received his testimony has set his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life but the wrath of God abides on him. Wow, lots, lots to see. But let's start with verse 30 right here. He must increase, but I must decrease. This is a great verse for you to memorize. You can memorize this today, couldn't you? He must increase, but I must decrease. And if you want to remember which one comes first, the increasing or the decreasing, Well, just remember that God comes first, right? That's part of his increasing in your heart. He. So the verse starts with he, not I. He must increase, but I must decrease. Wow. So let's meditate on that for a moment. And 
consider uh, what it is that we are to glean from that. Okay? Well, this is really a great summary of the Christian life. He must increase, but I must decrease. This attitude should absolutely be primary in the heart of anyone who claims the name of Christ, who wants to serve God, who wants to honor and glorify God as he is to be worshipped in the appropriate way. And if we are to consider the, uh, the grammar here, it is present tense that he must increase and that we must decrease, meaning he must continue on increasing in our hearts, in our minds, and we must continue on decreasing in our hearts and minds, meaning day by day, continually, an aspect of having our minds renewed in the truth is that God, particularly God's glory manifested in the person and work of the Son, Jesus Christ, that must continually become greater and greater to us. It must become a bigger, more impactful reality. It must, uh, God's glory needs to become paramount in our lives as we continue to walk with Him and and grow. Uh, And in contrast, our own self-righteousness, our own, I don't know, trying to make ourselves first place in everything, our selfishness, our selfish ambition, our looking in the mirror and thinking we're hot stuff. No, that may be literal for some of you, but hopefully for most of us, that's just metaphorical. All of that has to decrease. We have to keep getting lower and lower in our minds. So you, you think you have a high view of God and you've got a low view of yourself. It needs to continue going. You're not there yet. You need to keep going. And really, all of eternity is going to be exploring the greatness of God. And we're going to be doing that as believers. The, all the believers in the biblical gospel are going to be doing that for all eternity in the new earth, as we are in a totally new creation, and uh, there will be limitless ways to explore the greatness of God. And it won't just be in an immaterial sense where we're floating around and playing music and I don't know, doing Gregorian chants. No, no, no. We'll be exploring waterfalls and mountaintops, fellowshipping with God himself. I suppose we'll even eat and drink, too. (laughs) It's going to be awesome. And all of that's going to be without sin. And in that environment, we're going to understand so much more than we understand now the greatness of God and the lowliness of ourselves. We're going to be able to grasp more what true humility is, that we are we are really low, and we should be low in our own minds, and God should be high in our minds. There's so much to say on this. I actually recently uh, wrote a little, I don't know, it's, it's more than a pamphlet, I guess, uh, but it's certainly not a booklet. So whatever's between a pamphlet and a booklet, I, I wrote uh, on the topic of exaltation, and the question is, will you be exalted? And in that, I explore first how God is king, and he is to be exalted above all else. But the next thing I look at is how Satan, the original sin, the very first sin, was this idea that I can be like God. I will make myself like the Most High. It, the very first sin was like self-exaltation from self-righteousness. That is the total opposite of what John the Baptist here is calling really all people to do, that God must increase and we must decrease. So this is the heart of faith. This is the heart of Christian living. This is the heart of eternity, that God would increase and we would decrease. So that that final statement of John the Baptist there really does lead us into these thoughts from John the Apostle that are also very crucial and very important. So let's now go back and see how John the Apostle adds his commentary to what John the Baptist just said. Verse 31 again, He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is from the earth and speaks of the earth. 
He who comes from heaven is above all. Now, if you're watching on video, you can have the verse right in front of you here, or maybe if you're, if I'm just in your earbuds somewhere, you can check your Bible. Look at the contrast that John is setting up for us. There are two origins for two different people. You have he who comes from above, verse 31, at the very beginning. His origin is from above. He has come to earth from above. Now you have a second person. He who is of the earth is from the earth and speaks of the earth. So you have two people on the earth, one who came from heaven and the other who came from earth itself. And the result of observing this contrast is the realization that he who comes from heaven is above all. Now, I find this quite interesting, especially given uh, Latter-day Saint theology that teaches we all came from heaven, that we all had a premortal existence, and uh, we had a heavenly existence with Heavenly Father, and we all came from above to the earth to take on earthly bodies. Uh, Actually, in John's Gospel, on multiple occasions, we are told that there's only one who has done that. There's he who has come from heaven, and he's above all. Because everyone else has come from the earth. We are all creatures. So this is actually the first place that John the Apostle goes as he is commenting, essentially, on what John the Baptist just said. He must increase, but I must decrease. The first place you can go doctrinally in your mind to understand this is that creatures are lower than the Creator. Jesus comes from above because Jesus is God. He is creator God. He is sovereign over all, who, the one who has made all things, the one who is in control of all things. He is very God of very God, to quote an old confession. Yet you cannot say that about us. We are the work of his hands. We are the sheep of his pasture, Psalm 100 says, or maybe 103 Go read both of them and see which one I was just quoting. (laughs) We are of the earth, it says, verse 31, and from the earth. Therefore, we speak of the earth. We speak earthly things. And yet there is one who has come from heaven who is above all, and he actually speaks heavenly things. And that's the next couple of verses. What's Jesus' testimony all about? Well, let's read verses 32 and 33 again. What he, Jesus has seen and heard, of that he testifies, and no one receives his testimony. But he who has received his testimony has set his seal to this, that God is true. So we talk about here at the beginning, or John talks about rather, what Jesus has seen and heard. That's what he testifies. What has Jesus seen and heard? Well, if you've been following along in this New Testament series so far, the very first lesson from the New Testament was about Jesus' deity, his origin. And uh, we have these glimpses into eternity past in the New Testament where the authors of Scripture take us to Jesus' pre-incarnate existence. Before he took on flesh in the incarnation, before he became a man, He had a true, real existence because he's from above. He's not from earth like we are. So he had this existence beforehand. And we get a glimpse in John 1, 1. We get a glimpse in John 17, 5. We get a glimpse in Philippians 2, starting in verse 5, I believe. We get these little peaks into what was going on. And what we have in each one of those is that Jesus is God. Each one of those verses affirms that Jesus is, has always been God, and he was sharing in the same glory as the Father. That's what you got going on in each one of those. And so he had fellowship with the Father, and he and the Father are one. There is but one God. So uh, this is, again, Trinitarian theology, but I'm not 
wanting to impose any outside theology on the text. I want all of my theology to come out of the text of the Bible. And I think that's what we're getting here as we start stitching all these things together, especially you throw in Hebrews chapter 1 and Colossians chapter 1. You really start getting a lot of context here about Jesus, uh, his nature. Well, he was with the Father, so distinguished from the Father, yet he's the one true God, as the Father is the one true God, and they're sharing in the same glory. Now, in that existence, of course, he saw and heard many things. He is eternally a person, after all. A person has a personality. A person has the ability to hear and see and interact. So in his pre-earthly existence that stretches into eternity past, he was enjoying fellowship with the Father, seeing and hearing many things. Not that he was lesser than the Father in nature and learning something because the Father was more advanced than him. No, that's not it at all. So don't let your mind wander there. That's not what the text says. But he was seeing and hearing many things as a person through all eternity as he was in fellowship with both the Father and the Spirit. And as he comes to earth, then, John the Apostle tells us that this is what he is sharing with us. That's what he is testifying about. So what's amazing is as we read the words of Scripture and the words of Christ in particular, he is sharing with us eternal truths that he has interacted with for all eternity. That really just puts some heavy weight on the Word of God, doesn't it? Pretty amazing stuff. Well, then it goes on to say, John goes on to say, that of this testimony, no one receives it. So he just set us up with the awesome glory of Jesus' testimony to lead us right into this reality that no one receives his testimony. Now, what on earth does that mean? Because there are people who believe, right? Today, there are believers in Jesus. And even then, there were people who believed. Jesus had disciples who had faith and followed him. Uh, John himself, who's writing that letter, was one of Jesus' disciples who received his testimony. Well, this is just a figure of speech. This is hyperbole, and it's a pretty obvious hyperbole, isn't it? When you consider that he just was quoting John the Baptist, who received the testimony of Jesus, and he himself is a receiver of the testimony of Jesus. It's kind of like at the beginning of John's Gospel in John 1.11, where it says that Jesus came to his own and his own did not receive him? Well, some of them did, right? His disciples, we're looking at Jews here, aren't we? So um, his, he came to his own, and the Jews, and some of them received him, but not many, right? So we, we see hyperbole in Scripture sometimes, and this is one of those cases. And again, it's really obvious, especially considering the next verse, Because the next verse says, he who has received his testimony, well, that means that there are some people who received his testimony, has set his seal to this, that God is true. What is the receiving of the testimony of Jesus? It's that these eternal truths that Jesus has shared with us, that he has heard and seen for all eternity, that he's now bringing to us, we are affirming that this is true. The acceptance of of Jesus is the acceptance of God's Word. We're not fighting with God, but we are accepting His message in Jesus, and through Jesus, and about Jesus. That's what true faith is. Those who receive His testimony are the ones who don't fight with Him about His Word. Again, it goes back to this big idea of He must increase and we must decrease. We see something in the Bible and we say, nah, that can't be right. Well, you're not receiving the testimony at that point, are you? You're no longer receiving the testimony. Instead, you're rejecting what is true. And that's not the position of faith. The position of faith is God knows. He's the creator. He has all authority. He has all wisdom. And I'm going to put myself in submission to God, my creator. Okay, well, let's continue reading. Where does John take us next? These are all amazing thoughts. Verse 34, For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, 
for he gives the Spirit without measure. So again, it's an affirmation of Jesus' trustworthiness as the messenger who's bringing eternal truths to us. He's the one that God has sent, and he speaks the words of God. Jesus' words are to be trusted completely. These are the words of God. And then it goes on to say, for he gives the Spirit without measure. Now, there are a couple of ways this can be interpreted. Um, He gives the Spirit without measure. So we could be thinking of uh, ourselves, those who believe in Jesus and are born again, as spoken of earlier in this chapter, those who are born from above are given the Holy Spirit. New Testament theology fleshes this out, uh, really builds on this doctrine, that all who believe in Jesus at the moment of conversion, they are washed and regenerated by the work of the Holy Spirit. He seals them until the day of redemption. He dwells within them. Their bodies become temples of the Spirit. He is with them always, leading, guiding, directing, teaching, bringing about fruit, bestowing spiritual gifts. That is all true. All right, and that's just a reality uh, that the Bible presents to us for those who believe in the gospel. However, there's another side of this too when we consider he gives the Spirit without measure. He gives the Spirit without measure. Jesus had the Holy Spirit too, didn't he? We explored a couple of weeks ago Jesus' virgin birth, and Mary was told that the Uh, Holy Spirit would overshadow her, and that is how she conceived. And we looked at Jesus' baptism. We see that uh, the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove. And uh, we looked at Jesus' temptation, and he was led into the wilderness by the Spirit to be tempted of the devil. So we have just so far, very early on in our New Testament study, we have these affirmations about the life of Jesus that he had the Holy Spirit. And in his human existence, there was this aspect of being led by the Spirit. Jesus was made for a little while lower than the angels. That's what we're like. And there's a necessity for humans to be led by the Spirit, and Jesus was led by the Spirit perfectly. In uh, Acts chapter 10, Peter is preaching a sermon here, and starting in verse 37, Peter says, You yourselves know the thing which took place throughout all Judea, starting from Galilee, after the baptism which John proclaimed. So what, what took place after John the Baptist? Well, verse 38, You know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. The Holy Spirit was with him. God was with him. God anointed him with the Holy Spirit. God was with him. So God bestowed upon Jesus, God the Father bestowed upon God the Son and flesh, the Holy Spirit without measure, in fullness, total, complete fullness. And so not just is there this aspect of we have the Holy Spirit, who are believers, who have been born again, that is true, but also Jesus, his ministry was characterized by the powerful leading of the Spirit in his own life. Pretty cool, huh? All right, back to John 3. Let's look at verse 35. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. A simple statement uh, that refers to the relationship between the Father and the Son. Great, great statement. The Father loves the Son. How, how is the Father characterized in his relationship with the Son? Love. The Father loves the Son. And has given all things into his hand. Jesus says at the uh, end of Matthew's gospel, right before the Great Commission, Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So all things have been given to Jesus Christ, and that's why I think it's a trustworthy phrase. I picked this up from my pastor in Kansas City. You cannot thank 
too highly of Jesus Christ. If all things have been given into his hand, I'm telling you, you can't think too highly of him. You can't reach that point where it's like, oh, that's too high. Nope, nope. You can't think too highly of Jesus Christ. And then verse 36, he who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So we see here as we finish up, there is an obligation to obey the Son. So we uh, get this phrase here, believes in the Son, he who believes in the Son, but he who does not obey the Son. So there's a uh, kind of an equating here of believing and obeying. We'll talk about that in a moment. But in both cases, the object is the Son. So there's an obligation upon man to submit himself to the Son in faith. That's what's absolutely clear in this verse. He is the one to whom we are to obligate ourselves. There's a responsibility that we have to obey, to believe the Son. And, and what's the deal with this obey language and believe language? Because you get, again, at the start, this word believes in verse 36, and then it goes on to say obey. Well, I think this can be pretty simple. This can be understood quite simply. To obey the Son is to believe the Son, right? And to disobey the Son is to reject the Son. I think that's fair enough, don't you? To believe the Son is to obey Him. And to reject him is to disobey. And there's a lot on the line in this endeavor, because the one who believes has eternal life, it says in verse 36. Yet the one who rejects the Son, look how certain this is, will not see life, but instead wrath And it's the wrath of God, not the wrath of Satan, not the wrath of man, but the very wrath of God. So eternal life versus the wrath of God all hinges on what you do with Jesus. Do you believe the biblical Jesus as revealed to us here, or do you not? Well, how do we acquire life? How do we acquire eternal life? What does it mean to obey or believe the Son. Well, I love John 6, 29, where Jesus says to the crowd, this is the work of God, to believe in the one whom he has sent, to put the full weight of our trust in Jesus and what he has done, who he is, what he has done, all of our merit, comes from him. There is no righteousness of our own. He is continuing to increase, and we are continuing to decrease. This is the work of God, John 6, 29, to believe in the one whom he has sent, put the full weight of our trust in Christ. And I want to point out one last thing in John three thirty six you'll notice that when it says, he who believes in the Son, it says, has eternal life. It doesn't say, will have eternal life. This is present tense language. Eternal life begins now. The person who believes in Jesus has life now. We're not working our way towards something. We have it now. Now, there's more to come. That's certainly true. But we have eternal life now. And in conjunction with that, the one who does not obey the Son will not see life. Okay, so now we got a future tense thing going on. But look at this. The wrath of God abides on him, not will abide on him or will come to him or he will face the wrath of God in the future. But this is also present tense language saying the one who has rejected the Son, right now he is abiding under the wrath of God. And in Romans chapter 1, there's an expansion of this theme, where it talks about the wrath of God is now revealed from heaven. And it's seen in the way God hands people over to the the folly of their own sin. Uh, People who are deluded by their own wisdom, the wisdom of this world. He hands them over to it. 
And that's actually evidence of God's wrath abiding on them in the here and now. But uh, it doesn't have to be that way. God will embrace the sinner who comes to him for eternal life. God will embrace the one who comes to him in faith, who says, Lord, I, I want you to increase continually, and I want to be made low. I want to be found at your feet, face down, worshiping you. I'm coming to you empty-handed. Receive me, a sinner, based on what Jesus has done. There is a guarantee in that. The guarantee is that God will accept you. So what will you do with the biblical gospel? I I think this study is really instructive uh, about our relationship to God. What will you do with the gospel as it's presented here in the Bible? Will you embrace it or will you reject it? My prayer, my hope for you, I I don't know who you are. you're, You're listening to this? I don't know. I might have met you before, but I don't know who's listening. But I'm I'm hoping and praying that you will receive the Lord Jesus Christ and be born again. You can be a saint today. You can have eternal life today by trusting in what Jesus has done, dying on the cross in your place for your sins, rising again from the dead, ascending to the right hand of the Father, that you would be made perfect in the sight of God in an instant based on the merits of Jesus. Who wouldn't want to believe that good news? Thanks for listening today. I hope this has been helpful. God bless.